Well, hi, y'all, and welcome back. This is Professor True Love's Concepts for Nurses series, and I am Professor Terry True Love. And in this episode, one of the respiratory concept episodes, we're going to look at oxygen therapy, and specifically oxygen delivery devices. Sources for this podcast include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing and Soul's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing. Recall that we live on the bottom of an ocean of air, and that air is a mixture of different gases. The primary gases that we're going to be concerned with are nitrogen because it takes up the bulk of that mass, that is about 70% of the air is nitrogen, and about 21% of that mixture is oxygen. So it would be accurate to say that the FiO2 of room air, that is the air that we breathe, is 21%. Well, oxygen is essential for life and the function of the cells and tissues. It is an excellent source to extract energy from things like sugars. Respiratory, cardiovascular, hematologic systems all work together, providing sufficient tissue provision to the body. And what that means is, if there's a problem with either the respiratory or the cardiovascular or the hematologic systems, we are not oxygenating adequately. Oxygen therapy improves oxygenation and tissue perfusion. So what that means is the oxygen therapy itself is a supplement that will assist the tissues in having an adequate amount of oxygen. Because as soon as the tissues start to sense that they're lacking oxygen, they will send all kinds of chemical and neurological signals to the brain saying, hey, I need more oxygen. This will manifest itself as respiratory distress, which can be seen on the patient by things like dyspnea, nasal flaring, the use of accessory muscles to breathe, purse-lipped or diaphragmatic breathing, decreased endurance, and skin and mucous, mucous membrane changes, including cyanosis and even pallor. Think about the vital signs changes that are going to be associated with this, including tachypnea and tachycardia. Again, ways for the body to try to compensate. So do your best to assess the patient's respiratory system. Assess the upper respiratory system, including the nose and the sinuses, the pharynx, the trachea, and the larynx. Looking at the lungs and thorax, not only for listening to breath sounds, but listening to things like resonance, that is, are there any areas which so show consolidation and therefore could be an area where gas exchange has been compromised. Look at the movement of the chest wall. Look for symmetry and vibrations called fremitus. Look at the overall general appearance, including the shape of the ribcage and the development of the supporting muscles. And of course, looking at the skin and mucous membranes to see if they've undergone changes associated with chronic low oxygen levels. Earlier, we were speaking of the body's compensatory mechanisms that would manifest themselves not only in things like dyspnea, but in changes in vital signs such as tachypnea and tachycardia. This graph shows that the addition of supplemental oxygen will reduce the body's need to compensate. In other words, the heart won't have to beat quite as frequently. The respiratory uh, center will not have to breathe quite as frequently if we add supplemental oxygen. The supplemental oxygen will compensate for the lack of oxygen at the tissues. You should realize that although oxygen saturation levels, particularly pulse oximetry, is a very excellent tool to trend your patient, it is not so good at diagnosing your patient. Too many variables can occur without a comprehensive assessment. So an arterial blood gas would be indicated instead. We will cover arterial blood gases in a subsequent episode. The purpose of oxygen therapy is to relieve hypoxemia. You should be able to differentiate hypoxemia, that is low levels of oxygen in the blood, from hypoxia, which is defined as decreased tissue oxygenation. You can really only say your patient has hypoxemia if you're looking at an arterial blood gas. So the goal of oxygen therapy is to use the lowest FiO2 possible for the best, that is the most acceptable, blood oxygen levels without causing harmful side effects. Because remember, oxygen is poisonous to the cells. Pure oxygen is poisonous to the cells. 
there can be alveolar changes uh, with high FiO2 levels as quickly as within 72 hours. Oxygen therapy can be dangerous and not because oxygen explodes. That is a common myth. Instead, things that normally wouldn't burn burn very nicely in the presence of elevated levels of oxygen. So much so that those things can burn explosively, that is very quickly. So besides combustion, other problems include oxygen-induced hypoventilation. For instance, hypercarbia is the retention of CO2. In some conditions, the patient may have constant hypercarbia. This may mean that one of the mechanisms to induce breathing may be permanently shut off. That is, the body may ignore the constant permanent high carbon dioxide levels. If that occurs, and if the person is receiving too much oxygen, that may also shut off their need to breathe because the other mechanism to take a breath would be because of low oxygen levels. If you're satisfying oxygen levels and the patient has chronically high carbon dioxide levels, there may be no need for them to breathe, and that's called CO2 narcosis. Oxygen toxicity occurs in the presence of too much oxygen. Again, oxygen is poisonous to the cells. It helps them to break down. And this can lead to absorption atelectasis, which is the new onset of crackles and decreased breath sounds and even the drying of mucous membranes, which could lead to infection. Oxygen delivery systems are variable and really depend on the needs and the availability. So, types used depend on the oxygen concentration required or what needs to be achieved, the importance of accuracy. In other words, do I need to give the person exactly an amount of oxygen or can it vary? And this is going to be the difference between your low flow systems, which give you an FiO2 that can have a range in a high flow system or even a ventilator in which you can dial in a precise FiO2. Um, patient comfort is another thing that will impact your choice of oxygen delivery systems, the importance of humidity, and the need for patient mobility. It is actually quite rare for a patient to require a precise FiO2. Instead, a range of FiO2 is more than adequate to meet their needs. And this is one of the reasons that the most common source of oxygen in healthcare are low flow oxygen delivery systems. They, you should know they do not provide enough flow by themselves to adequately meet the patient's minute ventilation demands, but that's not important. There's more than enough supplemental oxygen to meet their needs. Now, some different types of oxygen delivery devices include nasal cannulas, oximizers, and the different types of masks. And we'll be discussing some of those right now. The device most people are made aware of that delivers oxygen is a nasal cannula. And nasal cannula are the prongs that go into the nose. They should be facing slightly downward to match the anatomical curve. You can have a flow rates of one to six liters per minute, and that will give you a concentration anywhere between 24 and 44 percent. After six liters per minute, you should not add any more oxygen because the anatomical space that the nasal cannula depends on has been filled up. Now, what anatomical space does the nasal cannula depend on? Your sinuses and your pharynx and your larynx. After six liters, you're just spilling oxygen into the environment and you're not giving it to the patient. Um, so while you're using nasal cannula, assess the patency of the nostrils and assess for changes in respiratory rate and depth, which could indicate either distress, that is you're not getting enough oxygen, or things like narcosis. Your patient may require more oxygen or they may, not, they may be on home O2 and want to conserve some of their oxygen. So a reservoir nasal cannula would be indicated. And one of the reasons that this is beneficial to, especially at home patients, is because you can have the same amount of oxygen coming to the patient, but the amount of oxygen being delivered to the device is actually going to be lower. So it is ideal for the home setting because it saves oxygen. FiO2 skin, this can range anywhere from 29% to 51%, according to uh, the critical care manual. Um, high flows of 10 liters have even been shown to achieve FiO2s of greater than 65%. However, those are rare and those are limited studies. The best way to recognize that this device is going to deliver more oxygen is because of the extra reservoir underneath the nose in this case. Sometimes it's hung on a pendant. 
But now you have the pharynx, the larynx, and this reservoir as places that you can store oxygen before the patient takes in their next breath. But if that is still not sufficient oxygen reserve, then we will increase the size of the reservoir by attaching a simple face mask. And this is an example of a simple face mask. Notice that you have extra reservoir space as between the patient's face and the mask itself. So this delivers O2 between 40 and 60 percent. Do not set this less than 5 liters per minute because carbon dioxide can build up inside of the mask at 5 liters or less. Make sure that the mask fits securely over the nose and the mouth and monitor closely because these masks do put your patient at risk for aspiration. Rebreather masks work because they increase the size of the reservoir. And in this case, we have an example of a partial rebreather mask. Notice again, not only do we have the sinuses and the larynx and the pharynx and the mask itself, but now there is an attached bag. All are areas in which oxygen can be stored until the next breath. Therefore, the patient doesn't necessarily draw in room air. They draw in the air that's permeated with oxygen in the mask and in the bag. These provide anywhere from 60 to 75 percent with flow rates of 6 to 11 liters per minute up to one-third of the tidal volume can be compensated for with each breath. However, you as the provider should adjust the flow rate to keep the reservoir bag inflated. In other words, if the patient's taking breaths so deeply that they're deflating the bag, turn up the oxygen for them. A partial rebreather mask differs from a full non-rebreather mask in that there are two valves on either side of the mask that don't exist in the non-rebreather. This prevents the patient from pulling in any outside air at all, and this, therefore, will generate the highest O2 level of any of the low-flow devices. They can easily deliver FiO2s greater than 90%, and they're normally reserved for unstable patients requiring intubation, and those patients are going to have constant monitoring, because one of the problems with this is that if the patient's oxygen supply gets disconnected, they will be cut off from any additional air. Carbon dioxide will build up in the mask, and they could be in trouble in that way. So therefore, it's important that you ensure the valves are patent and functional. High flow systems are different from low flow in that they use gas laws in order to entrain additional flow. And these are known as Bernoulli's or Venturi's principles. In a nutshell, the reason that these are beneficial is because if you do have a need to precisely dial in an FiO2 on your patient, these are the devices that you want to use. Um, they are all connoted as high flow. They can deliver anywhere from 24% to 100% at between 8 and 15 liters per minute. And they include devices such as Venturi masks, face tents, aerosol masks, tracheostomy collars, and TPs. You will normally find the first three only really in places like the PACU, that is recovery rooms, and in critical care units. And tracheostomy collars and T-pieces are normally reserved for the rehabilitation centers, especially the neural uh, rehabilitation centers in patients who require long-term ventilation and at the home health setting. This is an example of a Venturi mask. And the way it works is there's adapters that are located on the, uh, between the bottom of the mask and the O2 source. And the jet generated by the O2 source blows through a narrow opening and around those narrow openings are other larger openings. And you can vary the size of those other openings to allow either less air or more air to be pulled in by the jet. That mixture of air is what the patient's going to be breathing. And since the total flow of the delivered oxygen and the entrained air is going to exceed pretty much anybody's minute ventilation, this means the patient's gonna have a precise FiO2. It is the best device to use for chronic lung disease patients who are having hypoxemia problems. However, because of the nature of the mask, you need to change over to a nasal cannula during mealtimes. This illustration is of a T-piece. These are, um, they deliver desired FiO2 for things like tracheostomies, laryngectomies, and endotracheal tubes. They ensure humidity, humidification through the creation of a mist, and the mist should be seen during inspiration and expiration. What's not being seen here on the left side is you have a precise 
high flow oxygen delivery system. And that includes a device that mimics what the Venturi mask does. In other words, there is a jet of oxygen blowing through an opening and surrounding that are larger openings that can vary in size depending on the FiO2. That is also run through a device which humidifies and even sometimes will warm that mixture of gas. You have to warm the mixture of gas because these devices, these endotracheal tubes and these tracheostomy tubes, bypass the normal anatomical features like the sinuses, which provide humidity and warmth to inspired air. Here we have a picture of a young lady who's wearing a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation mask, or an NPPV. You can use positive pressure to either keep the alveoli open or to improve gas exchange without a direct airway intubation. And the two ways that you'll see this delivered are referred to as CPAP and BiPAP. Both of them happen to refer to the pressures used to help push the air into the patient. A CPAP device has a starting pressure that is equal to the ambient pressure that the patient is currently in. In other words, the normal barometric pressure of the environment. CPAP means that there's going to be an amount of pressure given from the machine that will push or deliver air to the patient. So it delivers set positive airway pressure throughout each cycle of inhalation. And if it's BiPAP, that is bi-level positive airway pressure, not only will the machine provide pressure during inspiration, but it'll also provide pressure during exhalation. That does a couple of things. The most important thing it does is to help keep the small airways open. By keeping the small airways open, that should improve gas exchange. So by doing this, this is great for atelectasis, particularly after surgery or cardiac-induced pulmonary edema, and even for patients suffering from sleep apnea. A type of delivery system that is sometimes seen for patients who require long-term permanent use of oxygen is what's called a transtracheal oxygen delivery system, or a TTO. This is for the long-term delivery of oxygen, and it goes directly into the lungs. So a small, flexible catheter is passed into the trachea through a small incision. This avoids the irritation that things like nasal cannulas, um, it is way more comfortable. Even though it seems like it would be more uncomfortable after a while, the patient would get used to it. The flow rates are prescribed for different activities. For instance, if your patient's active, you'll increase the amount of oxygen, and if they're sleeping, you can decrease the amount of oxygen, depending on their metabolic needs. Any of these devices can be found in the home health setting. So it is important that we know about home oxygen therapy. Make sure that the patient is aware for any criteria needed for the equipment to properly operate and to maintain proper hygiene. So patient education needs to include that there's going to be a gas delivery system. Normally it is in a compressor, but it can sometimes be in a tank or cylinder. We sometimes deliver the oxygen via liquid form, via a reservoir, or another device can be called an oxygen concentrator. It is important that the patient realizes how these things work so they can determine if it's actually functioning or not and if they're getting the correct or prescribed amount of oxygen. Oxygen delivery devices are found in all areas of the healthcare system and it is important that you understand the purpose and the need for oxygen therapy. That does conclude this episode of Concepts for Nurses. However, stay tuned because more episodes are to come. As always, I hope you learned a little bit. I hope you plan on coming back to listen some more. And if you are, we'll see you then. Take care.